Hello. Hey, everyone. Hi, I'm Mike Gelson, founder of VoiceLessons.com. With me, I have Dr. Matthew Edwards. Matt, welcome again. Hey, happy to be here. Awesome. So we're, we're jumping on in. We've got another uh, question, series of questions. We're doing, we do these every week. So if you're just tuning in, um, you haven't checked out our show, we've been doing these now for what, almost two years coming up. Hey. So a lot, a lot of questions, a lot of answers, giving out a lot of tips. Um, we're going to give you an opportunity if you're curious on where you can hear more of these, uh, where you can go. Um, but let's just jump right on into the, the questions we got this week about some, some more stuff on songs and singing and style and stuff like that. So the first one that I have here for you guys comes in from Taylor. Um, the question is, what tips do you have for putting more emotion behind my lyrics? So probably singer songwriter. I think uh, we've been you know trying different uh, groups out there. So what do you have for Taylor? Yeah. So look, Taylor, there's a lot of things that you can do to start trying to do that. So I'm just going to touch on one uh, little clue tonight that can uh, get you maybe some new ways to think about things. Um, but there's definitely other options if you want to go back through the archives where we've talked in the past. You get maybe some other ideas. Uh, what I want to do is walk you through what's called an emotional recall exercise. Okay. And uh, this actually comes from an acting technique, but songwriters are doing this already. So it's really just helping you go through the same process that a lot of songwriters did that actors later figured out how to do, you know, it all kind of crosses over. So, you know, songwriters write songs about life experiences and those songs come to them a lot of times as the life experience just keeps running through their mind, right? It plays inside their head like a music video and they feel like they got to do something to like get it out. So they start writing and then it becomes a song. OK, well, actors, when they pick up like a script, they didn't write it. So it didn't come from their own personal life experience. So what they have to do is go through a series of steps to try to find some memory in their mind that can become as vivid as the songwriter's memory was. Then the songwriter wrote the song. OK, so what I want you to do is to just sit there, pick a song that you're working on, and I want you to close your eyes and listen really closely to the lyrics. And think about how those lyrics relate to you. And as you're listening, you might see little images that start to come in, right? It's like we have an, an internal YouTube inside of our brain, right? Uh, I don't understand the neuroscience behind that at all. But I know that, you know, we have all these visualizations that we can see. So what I want you to do is to allow the words of the songs you're listening to to start to bring those visualizations to life, to allow you... Might have to mute your mic there, Mike, uh, to um, allow you to start to, uh, you know, hear or as you're listening to the words to be able to start seeing images from your own past life that might relate to those words. And you're going to listen to the uh, song several times, letting those come alive in your mind. And then what I want you to do is to just maybe pause the music for a minute and just start speaking through. Keep your eyes silent, but speak through the words. And think about how those relate to those images that are popping up in your head, right? So if we're singing When the Party's Over by Billie Eilish, and the first words are, don't you know I'm no good for you? And you you're probably, if you really are connected, you have some past relationship that didn't go well. And even if those weren't the exact words that you said, there was a similar meaning of this relationship's not working, right? And so we call that the as if, the magic as if that you may not have been in a relationship where you literally said, don't you know I'm no good for you? You may have said, I don't think this is working anymore, right? But you can translate that in your mind. You can think, I don't think this is working anymore as you sing, don't you know I'm no good for you? And as you start speaking those words, speak them as if you were reliving that memory, that situation. Because we have known from birth how to inflect our voice to take on emotional qualities. It comes from what's called infant directed speech, right? And you started picking this up around six months uh, old. You really started to understand it by the time you're about a year and a half to two years old. You understood that when somebody said no, it was serious. And when somebody said come here, it was kind and warm, right? So that's programmed into you. So as you're speaking these words, recalling those memories, your voice should start to inflect itself in a way that's representative of the emotions of that moment you're recalling. Then while you're sitting there, keep your eyes closed. I want you to start singing a cappella. And as you sing a cappella, 
I want you to not worry about having to sing it in tempo, but I want you to just start letting your voice bring that inflection from speech onto pitch, right? Because a lot of times the singer would do, don't you know, I'm no good for you, just trying to get it right. Instead, we want to speak it from that memory. Don't you know, I'm no good for you. Don't you know, I'm no good for you. Don't you know, I'm no good for you. And start letting it work its way into the pitch, but maintaining that emotional quality of the vocal that was stimulated by your memory of the experience that you associate with that song. Then what I want you to do is slowly then start to pick up the tempo until it feels like you're still able to sing it through in longer phrases. And then you're going to start putting it with the accompaniment, right? So if you're doing it with karaoke track or you're playing an instrument with it or whatever, and try to make sure that you're maintaining that same inflection in your singing voice that you discovered from the emotional recall exercise of reliving those memories. Now, the one important thing to remember is that sometimes when you do this, it's going to stir up a really strong emotional reaction. And we have two choices when that happens. One, we can just fall into a pit of despair and, uh, you know, just collapse. Or we can, you know, uh, avoid it completely and go, oh, I can't do this. It's too hard of a memory. Well, if you really want to get to a level where your voice is able to communicate emotion and you're singing, you have to learn the third stage, which I call teetering on the edge. So as you're doing this and you feel those tears start to come to you know, your eyes, if it's really emotional or it starts making you really angry, I want you to pause for a second and I want you to breathe. And I want you to just focus on your breath and remember that you're in the here, you're in the now. And you're actually not under the threat that whatever had happened in the past to put you in. And I want you to keep reminding yourself that I'm okay. I'm just doing this because I'm an artist and I need to sing this song to help other people understand they're not alone or to help other people, whatever your purpose is. When you feel like that emotion subsided ever so slightly, then start moving forward again. Because soon what will happen is you'll start learning how to walk up to that edge. So let's say this is the edge and over that's falling into emotional despair. And here is going, eh, I can't do that. I'm walking away. We want to live right on that edge so that we feel like we're just rocking. So we never lose emotional control, but we could at any moment. And that's what makes the greatest performances really exciting. You're watching a performer up there bearing their soul. And you're going, gosh, how can they just be so vulnerable, right? And that's what attracts us to them. And so you can develop that skill by doing this. Now, some people have, you know, serious trauma inside, uh, you know, from these past experiences. And if it's, you know, a really traumatic event, then you may not want to be doing this emotional recall exercise with it because it could end up being a little bit too much for you. So, you know, uh, you've got to make sure that you deal with something that, you're okay with right now. It may have been a bad breakup and it still kind of hurts, but you are moving on now and you can, you can sit, you can talk about it, right? If it's brand new happened yesterday, you're not going to be able to ride that edge. You're just going to fall over into the emotional despair. Now that might be a good place to write a song. You might find that it's cathartic to write a song about that emotional despair. And as you come back to it later and you still have those ideas in your mind, they'll still influence your voice, but you'll be able to ride that edge instead of falling right over into the abyss, all right? And so if you keep doing this with multiple songs, and as you're doing this, you're probably going to start listening to the song different. You're going to be listening and hearing how singers are allowing that to happen, especially if you're listening to a good singer-songwriter, uh, you know, doing it. So maybe go listen to like Brandi Carlisle. She's really, really good at this. I think Lady Gaga is amazing at it as well. Alicia Keys is really good at it. Christina Aguilera does some songs where you can really hear a lot of her life experience coming into each moment. So go and listen to those artists and listen to how their vowels morph, how they uh, release notes or how they enter into certain notes. And you'll notice that it has a lot in common with emotional speech that you would expect in whatever situation that song is about and is taking place in. And if you do this work consistently, you should start to see some differences in the way you deliver your songs and the way people perceive emotion in your voice. Yeah, that's great, Matt. I really like that emotional recall exercise for all of you out there. So great, great practical tip. And that's for me one of the reasons why I love answering these questions because we help so many people. So I see we have a chat. Comes in uh, a couple people chatting here. So I'm just going to pop over to that before we move on. Um, Vito, 
Uh, how can people perform with an emotion? So it's a uh, Vito. It's a lot of this work that I was just talking about. And if you tuned in a little bit later, just kind of re catch the replay. It'll post right on the VoiceLessons.com Facebook page uh, after this show closes. It usually comes up within a few minutes. Um, so that emotional recall work is going to be a real uh, big part of this. But I would say a lot of it is too is just spending time thinking about what every word means. Right. And sometimes we just pick up like the lyrics to um, <clears throat> someone you loved. I'm going under. And sometimes I feel that no one can save me. What does that mean? Right. I'm going under. We just look at that word and go, I'm going under. What is that? Well, under is representative of depression, maybe despair, loneliness, grief, feeling like you don't know where to turn. So what you have to do is you have to endow that word with a specific meaning, right? Especially if you're covering the song. If you wrote the song, then you know what that means. But if you're covering the song, you have to look at that and say, I'm going under. That means I'm going into this despair that I know. It's this despair that I've been in before. And sometimes I feel that no one, not my family, not my best friends, no one in my life can save me from hitting that low point. And once you define and endow every one of those words and you keep going through that, I'm going into despair. And when that happens, I feel like my friends, my family, nobody can help me not go into that spot. And you really start to think about that. It should start to uh, develop an emotional response inside of you. And then you just want to kind of keep speaking it, letting your voice follow and saying it over and over again. Not trying to get it right, just getting it out. I'm going under and sometimes I feel that no one can save me. I'm going under and sometimes I feel that no one can save me. I'm going under and sometimes I feel that no one can save me. And then you put it on the pitch. I'm going under and this time I feel there's no one to save me. And you see what comes out. And then you try it a different way. And you try it a different way. And it's really good to have a recorder going. Just use your phone's recorder. Throw it over, let it record, and then go back and listen. And you'll probably notice that there's a certain time that you really nailed it. And then try to replicate that and think what was going through your mind in that moment. Now, the first couple of songs you do this way, they're not going to get perfect. You're not going to nail it, but you're going to be learning. And after you've done about 20 songs this way, 20, 30 songs this way, you're going to be really starting to get it. And it's going to start to come to you more automatically. And you'll automatically pick up a song, read the lyrics, and you'll be like, oh, God, I feel this. This is just like X. And you'll be able to explain the situation. And when you do that veto, it should really start to help bring that emotion into your voice. And George, you know, what you're saying is you have a terrible time not crying during an emotional song. We all go through that. And the thing is, is that a lot of times when somebody breaks down, they put up their protective guard and our fight or flight syndrome kicks in and we want to run away and we want to leave. We have to just live in that vulnerability if we're going to be an artist who's really going to be able to. Uh, take other people to that place, right? We sing to communicate the human experience through song. And each of us has a different reason for doing that, right? And when I used to play in like my punk rock heavy metal band, it was because I wanted to destroy everything, right? I grew up in a working class community where my dad was always getting laid off. It was economic hardship all over the place. And, you know, I had a terrible situation in the school I was going to and everything. And so I was drawn to heavy metal because it was an outlet of all the rage I felt inside. So me playing in my band was about getting that out and about helping other people and be like, we're not alone, man. We're all in this. We all feel this. Right. And that was what was important to me then. It's not what's important to me now. Right. Now, if I was going to go out and perform, I would want to perform a song that made people think deeply about something. Right. And so that purpose for being is going to influence my songs in a different way. So also think, why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself out there like this? Why am I singing this song? I need to do this to let other people know they're not alone. I need to do this to help other people forget about their troubles and dance the night away. I need to do this to help other people get through their breakup because I did. And that's why I wrote this song. Whatever it is, that purpose, that intent behind it is going to really help you start to conquer this uh, issue where you feel like you just fall over. Because then when you feel those emotions kicking in, you have a reason to keep pushing forward. That purpose for doing this in the first place. And then, like I said, when you feel yourself tipping over that edge, just pause for a minute. Now, if you're doing a real performance, that's going to be tricky. But when you're practicing, pause for a minute, focus on your breath. When we focus on our breath, it helps our brain rewire back to its most basic necessary functions for life. And the emotions will often secede. 
or su uh, subside a little bit. And as they subside a little bit, wait for it and then go back into the song. And yeah, it's going to be hard, but if you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, then you're going to get better at being able to ride that line. Awesome. That's great. And I think you have, um, I was just going to say a couple of these things, the emotions, like a vocabulary list. I know you've got a new course that you've been working mm -hmm. on singing with style that includes some, some stuff. Do you want to tell us like, I think you have like a whole list of like the emotions, right? And practice. Well, yeah. When we talk. So yeah, I have a course. It's uh singing dash with dash style.com. You want to go check it. We're doing free orders on it right now. You can sign up to get a, an alert when it comes out. But um, in the course, I talk about this emotional recall and I give you a lot of these steps and worksheets to do this work. And then we talk about another, because like I had mentioned uh, to the original question that this is one of many ways that you can do this. There's another way called psychological gesture where you think about the internal desire to act. Like if I'm singing- uh, Oh, you know, don't give it all away. Okay, you guys, right, well, no. let's go to the next question. <laughs> good teaser, good teaser. All right. So next question for today, um, here we go. This is a good one. Do I need to learn how to read music? This one comes in from Brian. Great. What do you think? I, I, I'll, I'll go second on this one. <laughs> cool, I think it depends. I think it's really a personal decision and what kind of music you wanna sing. First of all, I think it's important to understand that indigenous cultures have been making music for as long as we've existed as human beings, right? There's even scientists believe that ne the Neanderthals probably were singing, right? And so if we've been singing forever, we know that music notation didn't really come in until the early Catholic church. And part of what happened then, there's probably some other notations in other cultures. Most of our music history is really European focused. And uh, I haven't, you know, really dove into music notation studies enough to know if other uh, countries may have had their own setup. But the Catholic Church at one point under Pope Gregory wanted to try to collect all of the different uh, music that was being performed in or not I guess performed, but used in mass. And so they sent people to go notate it out and bring it back so they could collect uh, them, find the best and put it into a book. So that's kind of like some of the early beginnings of it. The Greeks did have a notation system that they were using. Uh, and I think it even goes back to the Byzantine Empire, I believe. They may have some remnants of what they think was music notation back then. But if you look at indigenous tribes around the world, they're not writing their music down. They're communicating it by performing it together. And they learn the music because it's part of their culture and who they are. And a lot of traditions are that way. Uh, there's plenty of blues musicians, rock musicians that don't read music. They know chords. They know how to read tabs. They know their scales on their guitar, but they're going by ear and they're bringing everything together. And in fact, what sometimes happens with some artists is if they are somebody who's naturally inclined to play by ear and they start losing reading music, they start thinking that there's rules because in classical European music theory, there are rules. Like you never use perfect fits. But guess what? Pop music is made out of parallel fits. Those are all parallel fits. That's what rock guitarists are doing when they're doing their power chords. So, you know, in that instance, you might start learning about all these rules and it could actually start taking away some of your creativity because then you're thinking too much. But let's say you want to go be a musical theater performer. Well, you don't really have a choice. You need to learn how to read music because in that setting, uh, when you do a musical, they hand you a, uh, a script that's got all the notation in the back and the music director is going to expect that you can read it to bring that song to life. It's going to be the same if you're singing in most choirs, uh, if you're doing opera or any other classical form of music. Um, you know, a lot of jazzers are just incredible musicians and they know how to read the lead sheet so they, you know, can read it out and know what they want to do with it and move forward with it. So I think that, you know, if you're singing musical styles where sheet music is a part of the tradition, then, yeah, you should probably learn how to read music. All right. It's just another language. Right. And it's a much easier language than French, German, Italian. I've studied all those. Those are horrific. Sheet music is a lot easier to learn. Um, but, you know, if you're in a style of music you know, hip hop, rap, R&B, pop, rock, country, where it's been more of the, you know, the oral tradition of passing it down or just coming up with it on the spot, then I would say you probably don't. You probably just need to work with a lot of other musicians and learn how they think about music, learn how they write out charts for themselves, how they work, and then figure out what that genre requires and focus on that instead. I was going to come up with something to add to that, but I think you just, you nailed it, guys. Ah. So... 
I think, you know, to summarize what I heard Matt say is it's important, depends on where you want to go. Like what are, what are your goals for this, right? I think it's, I put more energy into knowing your scales, all, all your keys, all your chords, like your musicianship. Um, definitely I'm not going to say don't learn to read music, but if you have to pick where to spend your time, scales, scales, scales first. Um, and then, you know, the lead sheets, that's a huge thing. Jazz, the chords, progressions. So yeah. definitely. Um, for those of us that have been blessed, like you have to learn it. Maybe you've been forced as a kid to learn music. I mean, I, I hope everyone can learn to read music. So stay tuned. We're going to have a couple episodes. We actually have this as a bonus somewhere, right? Yeah. Matt, on reading music. Yep. Yeah. So we'll get you something, Brian. If you need to learn, I'll actually I'll drop you an email uh, with, with a tip on that. So let's jump into our next question. Okay, this one. Is it true that it's bad to sing in chest voice? It comes in from Annie. Good. No. No <laughs> is the answer. It's a big, hard no. It's not true that it's bad to sing in chest voice. Uh, I don't know how we have developed this myth over the years, because if you go back to the early teachers of some of the world's greatest opera singers, the people who were the original opera singers, they had them singing in chest voice. But in the early 20th century, especially in the United States, there is a handful of teachers that started saying that you had to develop the voice from the head down, from the top down. And they started avoiding the chest voice. And soon that became the chest voice was bad. And then it got a, you know, uh, this uh, association with belting. And I actually I did a talk about this back in the early 2010s that um, if you look at what that was associated with, the um, belt voice singing, the chest voice dominant singing was really seen in vaudeville. Excuse me, pardon me. Uh, seen in vaudeville and seen in minstrel shows. And minstrel shows were either black performers or white performers in blackface. And at that point in time, we had a huge racism problem in this country, right? And so there was a really negative set of terminology that was used to describe any kind of chest dominant singing, carrying it up, that associated it specifically with black people. It was racist. So that idea that chest voice was bad has racist roots at some point, right? And physiology, uh, if we look at the physiology of it, chest voice isn't coming out of your chest, right? The early uh, people who founded voice pedagogy said that it was chest voice because when you make a ah uh, sound, you feel vibrations down here. Well, that's just because you've got your vocal folds firmly pressed together and it's creating a lot of vibrations and vibrations like to travel across hard surfaces like bone. Whereas if you're doing ah, you're not creating as many uh, strong frequencies. So there's nothing to really travel across your bone. You're not going to feel it down here. You feel it more up in your face. And uh, that's why it's called head voice. So what is bad is when you take chest voice too high, too loud for too long. Okay. Hitting one or two notes in chest in a really emotional performance. It's not the end of the world. People yell all the time and they don't destroy their voice yelling once to stop a kid from running in front of a car. Right. People go to football games. They yell for three hours. They don't damage them and destroy their voices. They go hoarse, which is not good. And it is the beginning of what could become voice damage. But 90, probably 99% of the time, they don't cause immediate damage. Okay? I'm not endorsing yelling because you can hemorrhage. So we do want to avoid that. But what I'm saying is, is that if you're training with a coach to learn how to use your chest voice, and there's thousands and thousands of coaches out there. This isn't some secret that I hold on to. This is something that many, many, many teachers know how to do. They can show you how to start engaging chest voice safely. Then what that will do is help you discover what your chest voice sounds like. You know, I'm six foot four. I've got a big, heavy chest voice. Ah, Mike doesn't have as heavy of a chest voice. But yet, if you put electrodes on our neck that measure how firmly the vocal folds are closed together, you probably find that we're doing the exact same thing. It's just that his comes out one way, mine comes out another way. They're both right because they're both what our body is naturally designed to do. So when you're working with that teacher or coach, they're going to help you decide, well, yeah, you have a lighter chest voice or no, you got a really heavy chest voice. And then they can help you start carrying that up. And it's around this E and F above middle C for all genders. When you get to that E and F above middle C, that's when your voice will start to want to break. Now, some singers will carry chest way above that. Other singers are going to find they got to really start mixing. And what mixing means is that we don't push as hardly together. We start to thin out a little bit our vocal folds. <coughs> Excuse me, as they elongate, they thin out a little bit and the muscles that hold them together start to let go a little bit. 
more air comes through. We still get a really strong tone, but it's not pure chest. And mixing is really where it's at for most styles of singing, even belting. Belters, most belters up in the uppermost part of their range, they're not singing pure chest. You have some that do, right? You listen to Ethel Merman back in the day, she really did carry up the full chest. Uh, Adina Menzel, she can carry up some really strong chest. So can Christina Aguilera, right? So there's singers that definitely do that. But then there's singers like Ariana Grande who are mixing all the way up into the top. People love her voice. They say that she's an awesome belter. She is. But that's a mixed belt. It's not pure thick fold that she's shoving all the way up to the top of her range. So Annie, what I just want you to take away from this is that no, it's not bad for you. Indigenous people have been doing it for hundreds and thousands of years. And if you're running into trouble or somebody's telling you that it's not safe to do, then you know start looking around for a coach who says that it is and that they'll teach you because they do exist. They do know how to do it safely and they can absolutely help you expand that part of your voice and uh, learn how to mix throughout the rest of your range so you can sing whatever style it is that you'd like to sing. Yeah, absolutely. I would just ditto onto that. It's like if you're skipping the chest voice, mm. it's like going to the gym and not doing legs and only yeah. working on the upper, you know, part of your body, right? So you definitely got to hit that. The the rhythmoids are a huge part to what they do to help brace uh, the contraction of the cricothyroid. Matt's got some great models and goes over to, uh, this yeah. in detail <laughs> in another course that you've got the the how the voice works course, right? You actually talk about yeah, the we use all these great models, models, models got it. like this. Yeah, we can okay. Walk you through and show you all the parts, and we've got some great animations. I actually have videos in the course where you can go in and see exactly what's happening to the vocal folds. And I actually have we use some special uh, software where we can notate out and go, "Hey, this is what's happening here. This is what's happening there." Give you a much better idea, and then give you some exercises as well to start trying to apply that. It's on a launch special right now. It is a steal. Right now, it's $47. Go over to how-the-voice-works.com. Uh, you can read through everything that's in it. You can sign up for a free webinar if you want to get a little more of a taste of it before you jump in, but it's not going to stay at that price for long. That's like the price of a, a 20-minute voice lesson with me. So uh, thanks. Yeah, Mike just popped in into the chat. But yeah, for the around the price of a 20-minute voice lesson, you get four hours of content of me explaining all of this in great depth, 100-page workbook that goes with it guided listening where i walk you through listening to other singers so you can identify oh that's chest oh that's head oh that's mix i said i've got mri videos in there i've got stroboscopy videos inside of there oh wendy thanks it's great thanks, i appreciate wendy. that <laughs> yeah it's got all kinds of stuff in there to help you really understand what's going on in your voice and then there's a whole exercise pack i think it's 157 variations of exercises that you can do uh you know to start applying some of this to your own singing Awesome. Yeah, it's a great it's a great deal. But Annie, if you're skipping the chest voice, just I think the point we want to leave here is you got to work on it. If if you know, there's just many things I can just say can extend your range, even though it's at the bottom of your voice, you could actually sing higher by working on the bottom. So it's just all I, kinds of benefits from, you know, that. I so, cannot tell you how many. Okay, Let's jump on that. To add on. Yeah, go ahead. It's also important to add on here. I cannot tell you how many sopranos I've worked with that once we strengthen their chest voice, they've actually added two or three notes on the high end. Yeah, yeah, like half, maybe half an octave or a third, yeah. They'll add yeah. notes on the top and then they start going, how did my high end expand when I was building the bottom of my chest voice? There's an easy answer to it. When you were going high before, your muscles were so weak they couldn't hold the vocal folds together, so they just fell apart and it got broken. Yeah, it got let, let go. Right, because you trained your chest voice, you started strengthening the muscles that held your vocal folds together so that then when you went back into the uppermost notes, those muscles had enough strength to resist the stretch muscle and stay together, which then gave you all the vibrations you needed for you to actually have a voice up in that part of your range. And so, I mean, this is, I, you know, before I took my current job where I'm teaching at a university, I was singing with an opera company in uh, upstate New York called Tri-Cities Opera. And Peyton Hibbett was one of the voice teachers there. And Peyton was actually featured in Opera News as one of the four best classical voice teachers uh, at that time in the country when I was studying with him. And Peyton had every single female singer in her chest voice. They all had to sing the 24 Italian hits in mezzo keys, get that chest voice strong, and then all of a sudden the top would start ripping out. And on the opposite side, all of the men, the baritones, tenors, basses, we were singing in our falsetto all the time to lighten up our voice to learn how to get through the passaggio. So it's really about developing both parts of your voice. This really is an old technique that's been around for a long time. It just got lost somehow 
and uh, some of the head voice hype of the 20th century. But thankfully, the functional voice training that's been emerging in the past 20 years is really bringing it back to life. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's what I think you talk about a lot in your course is the, you know, how the voice works as it relates to functional training. So yeah. super cool. If you guys got to check that out, um, let's go on, jump into the next question. Moving right along. So this one comes in from Peyton. How do I get better at rock singing? So I like this. This is good. Good. All right. So I look, there's there's multiple ways to look at this. There's looking at it from a technical point of view, and there's looking at it from a style point of view. The technical point of view is an entire show. And so I'm going to kind of uh, just touch on it briefly and tell you that you need to develop your chest voice. You need to develop your head voice. You need to develop your mix in the middle. You need to sing like you speak. You don't want pure vowels. You don't need to have crisp consonants. All right. You don't need to have vibrato. You want to get speech-based singing that's driven by the rhythm underneath. All right. So technically, think about those things. If you need more info on that, either check out the course or go back through the archives on the voicelessons.com Facebook page. And you can see some past episodes where we've talked about belting. We've talked about head voice. We've talked about chest and all that. I actually tonight want to take a different angle at this, which is about mastering the style. Because that's another thing that's going to make you better at rock singing. Because some people think that it's only the technique that they need to focus on. They think the technique is the answer to making them better. And while technique is important and it's something you need to do, you simultaneously need to be training yourself as an artist. And how we're going to do that to start is with listening. What I want you to do is actually go back to the beginning of rock and roll. I want you to go all the way back into the 1930s. And I want you to start listening to what was going on in the blues, all right? 20s, 30s, the earliest recordings. Listen to Robert Johnson. Listen to what he was doing with the blues because that influences rock and roll. And then I want you to look up uh, uh, the Mama Thornton, the person who actually wrote Hound Dog, which Elvis Presley later did. I want you to listen to her music. And I want you to go in Spotify and look for related artists, all right? And see who else was singing around that time. Other people who uh, you may have been doing the exact same song or, you know, were recording at the same recording studio or whatever. Listen to those songs and start singing along. Then I want you to go on to Wikipedia and look up those artists and learn something about them. Because rock music came out of uh, historical events, cultural events. It came out of the blues. It comes out in the blues. If you don't know that, that comes out of spirituals. Blues were the uh, secular version of spirituals. And if you don't understand spirituals, you're missing a huge part of this history because that goes back to the enslavement of the African people and when they were brought to the United States. And it, when they came to the United States, they brought their culture with them and they continued to sing. Now, the white slave owners tried to force them to only sing Christian music. There's many reasons for that that you can read about in history books. And what would happen is when they were in the fields, they started to put their musical traditions to the European hymns they were being forced to learn when they were dragged to church on Sunday, right? It's a dark, terrible history, but you need to understand it if you're going to want to be a rock singer and really appreciate the music. Then when the slaves were freed, then we had that music continue to uh, be a part of society, but the blues started to become more and more popular. And you saw in industrial towns, uh, poor white people were working alongside of the recently freed black slaves and they were sharing music together. And that's why some early uh, what they called hillbilly music or country music has a lot in common with the blues because people were working together I and mean, working on farms together, working on the railways together, working in the shipyards together in a big city together. And music has always been a unifying force. Right. And it's something that we all make. And so we're fascinated by it. It brings cultures and people together. So you got a lot of cross pollination that eventually when we get into the 1900s and we're starting to get recordings that can be passed around, then you start having people grab onto that. And then the early 1940s and 50s, you had a lot of white artists starting to pick up on those blues sounds, mixing it with some of what was called rockabilly at the time. And that's how we got early rock and roll. So go listen to The King, listen to Elvis Presley, listen to Carl Perkins, listen to Johnny Cash. They were all part of what was going on at that time. Listen to Jerry Lee Lewis. Go read about the history, how they became who they were. Then I want you to keep moving forward by decades. Now, you got to understand that decades are not clear delineations of rock. It's not like the people in the 1950s thought, hey, we're going to write songs in the early rock style. And people in the later 1960s thought, hey, we're going to write protest rock music and psychedelic rock music. Nah. Styles evolved. 
but they were almost always fueled by what was going on in the world. So when you get into like the era around Vietnam, young people were ticked. They were not happy, right? They were being drafted against their will to go fight a war that nobody wanted to fight. And so they started writing songs that had a lot of anger and irritation inside of them because it was a release of what they were feeling in that situation in the world. And they started writing songs that had themes about protests. All right, go look up uh, war, right? War, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing, right? Go look up The Times Are Changing by Bob Dylan. Listen to them. Think about the words of that music and how it locked into the history and the culture of that time. Then move into the 1970s, and you're going to find that after the Kent State riots, when the government literally slaughtered college kids on a college campus because they were protesting against the Vietnam War, people realized, wow, our government will literally kill us. And the music changed. Right? It's not me saying it's historians, rock music historians point to that as being a pivotal moment. Well, all of a sudden, music started to shift. Drugs were becoming more popular. So we start getting more and more psychedelic music. Technology is improving at the same time. So we're starting to get new sounds out of guitars and keyboards, other instruments, different recording technologies. And all of a sudden, music starts to expand. Then as we roll into the 80s, uh, we definitely are seeing more of an influence of technology and the voices start to change. We go from guitars that were based off of vacuum tubes that are like little glass light bulbs that help power that. And when you turn it up loud enough, it gave it a distortion to the 80s when we use these transistors that give you really heavy distortion. And the heavier that distortion gets, the brighter the voice gets, the more gritty and edgy the voice gets. Well, then we get the drum kit starting to expand and the bass starting to expand and then you get into heavy metal. Right. And it's really just pushing everything to its max. And then as we roll into the 90s, we have a reaction to all that commercialization of rock and roll. And that's how we get grunge. That's how we get Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, uh, Stone Temple Pilots. Those bands were kind of reacting against the commercialization that they had seen happen in the 80s with the hair bands and the big uh, stadium tours. But then they end up, a lot of people say selling out, but they became popular and started making a lot of money. And so grunge kind of started to lose its footing. It was no longer the, the thing that it was when it was the resistance. But around that time, we got a computer invention called Napster. It was an app where people started sharing music. Now, that really put a lot of pressure on record labels. They didn't like it at all. They started to fight back. And what happened is Napster ended up having its own legal issues and other groups sprung up making deals with these record labels to stream the music and make it available for purchase. But when they did that, they also saw an opening to make money from independent artists who also wanted to put their music on that platform. So all of a sudden, the major record labels start losing their footing. And YouTube was really critical on that. So then you want to see what happens when we got you know, iTunes and people were able to use uh, apps like TuneCore to get their music out on iTunes. When Spotify came out and all of a sudden artists can release their music to the entire world. When YouTube came out and people start making uh, videos that get millions of views of cover songs. Something that wasn't doable before. And that brings us to today where the record labels have lost so much control over the music industry that now they're starting to sit back again like they did in the early days and wait till the talent starts to emerge, see if the talent is succeeding and then they put their money behind it. And once you understand all of that, you're going to start listening to music differently. And as you listen to music differently, you're going to start performing it differently. You're going to start thinking about what you learned by listening to the 1960s rock. And you're going to pick up a song that you want to cover and realize, oh, I want to bring some of that 60s grit into this because I think that gives a different take on it. Right. You might be writing a song and you might think, oh, man, I loved that 80s distorted guitar sound I heard when I was listening to Guns N' Roses. I want to use that effect and I want to write that into my song. But I want to combine that with that crazy keyboard sound I heard from the doors. And you know what? I want to put a huge drum solo in the middle of it like I heard with Iron Butterfly and Inagata DeVita. And the next thing you know, you have this like 16 minute jam band song that's mixing music from all these different eras. And so if you really want to get better at rock or any genre, this is what you have to do. You have to go and learn about the music by immersing yourself in it, understanding the history, understanding the culture, how those things influence the music, how the voice has changed because of those influences, how the voice has changed when the instruments changed underneath of it. And then start learning from everyone you can, pick the things that you like, ignore the things you don't, 
and then start integrating the things you do like into all of your work. And before you know it, you're going to start realizing that you've developed your own unique signature sound and style based off of all of the past influences that brought rock and roll to where it is today. Yeah, that right there is a great, I mean, Peyton, wow. Uh, I hope that really helped you. I feel like I got a month of homework to do right now. <laughs> At least. It but that. it's fun and, homework. And, I mean, and, and I've heard a decent amount of music in my life, but even then I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I can go back and do that one again. So yeah. there's just so many things to improve on. Um, Peyton, if you do have something specific you want, please write us back. We'll try and give a little bit more. I think that gave a really good um, – Helpful overview for many, many people out there uh, on how you can actually just so many ways to improve. So anything else on that one? No, I think that's it. Okay, sweet. Let's jump on into the next question. We might have time for one or two more. So uh, this one, uh, okay, it's some kind of technique one. Uh, this comes in from Jay. How do I improve my stamina? So that's a great question. Good. So you improve your stamina with vocal exercises. I think this is one of the big mistakes that people make. A lot of people try to improve their stamina in songs. I'll tell you why I think that's a mistake. Because when you're trying to improve stamina through songs, that means that you're thinking about technique and thinking about trying to improve your stamina when you should be thinking about being an artist, right? Instead, we want to do all those things that are about getting your body functioning better in exercises. And then we want to do songs and then the, when, when we're working on songs, we want to be thinking about incorporating what we've learned from the exercises and incorporate what we're learning as an artist by doing the things I just talked about in the, when answering that last question and the earlier questions today about emotional recall and whatnot. So one of my favorite things to do with this is just start taking exercises that you like and doubling and tripling them. So if you're used to doing like a simple one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one, you're going, ah, and you just do it one time. I want you to try to do it two, three, four, or five times in a row. See how many times you can get it out. Ah, right? So I could keep going. I'm not going to bore you. But you would do it as many times as you can. We're not trying to do a big range. But just doing that small range is starting to train your body how to resist the collapse of allowing that air to come into your lungs and then slowly be released, all right? And so that will start to get your body coordinated because a lot of stamina is also coordination. Your body's got to learn how to coordinate all the various parts that work together, as well as getting enough strength in the muscles that they can handle that work. So start small, just doubling, tripling, quadrupling as much as you can, all right? When you start feeling a little bit fatigued, that's a good sign to stop. You got to think about uh, what fatigue feels like, and I want you to relate it to weight training, right? So uh, I used to pre-children go to the gym a lot, and uh, I remember like I had one goal. I wanted to bench press 200 pounds. Uh, when I first started off, I could bench press 100 pounds. Very disappointing. Uh, but I kept working at it. Eventually, I did hit 200 pounds, and I felt great, but I didn't get there overnight. I got there by working on 100 until it felt easy, and then I went to 110. And then I worked on 110 till it felt easy. And then I went to probably 120. And you kept adding weight, stopping when it got a little too hard and not trying to go too far. Because if you went too far, what would happen is you'd lift that. You might have enough strength with your arms in this position to lift that bar up off. And then as soon as you start to bring it down, you realize I don't have this much strength. And that bar would fall down on your chest and you would have a big problem, right? Be very embarrassed sitting there in a gym yelling for help when you have Yeah, please use a spotter. Please use a spotter. <laughs> right. So using a spotter for your uh, vocalizing is not going to that point. You don't want to push it all the way up to the highest note that you got. If you know that the highest note that you can touch is an F, sure, when you're practicing, touch the F a few times. But don't exercise the F. Exercise the D. The D is about two, three notes below, right? F, then we have E, E flat, and D. Get the D really, really strong. The E flat really strong and the E really strong. And before you know it, touching the F will no longer feel like touching it. It'll feel like that F has shown up. That F has shown up because you strengthened and built stamina on the notes underneath, right? Because that's another big mistake the singers make. They want a high note, so they just keep trying to sing it over and over again. Why is that a mistake? You probably think, well, if I want a high note, that's why I need to do is keep practicing it, right? Well, yes, if you have good technique to do it. If you don't, and there's a slight bit of tightness, your brain starts remembering that tightness. You got to remember, singing's a motor skill. 
And our body's really good at memorizing movement patterns and really, really good at also memorizing the bad ones. So you go up there, let's say your larynx strains a little bit, your jaw tightens, you're trying to hit that G, your body's going to memorize that and think that's what you're supposed to do. And it's going to start to build the motor skill for that and put it into what we call the automatic phase, which means it just instinctually happens. And then you're going to spend a long time trying to break yourself out of that pattern. That's why it's better to focus on the note that's working, the D, E, E, F, whatever it is, and keep getting that good and touch the G and keep seeing, is it feeling better and feeling better? And when it feels good and free, then your body's ready for it. Then you want to start working on that note by itself. When you know that those notes are there, like that D, that's the note we want to build stamina on. Have the F, build stamina on the D. How do we do that? One, three, five, eight pattern. You're going to hold that high note as long as possible. So you're going to do yeah, 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 yeah. going to hold it and you're going to hold it as long as you can until you feel that it's trying to tighten in on you or if it's going flat it's losing power it's starting to sound strained the second the second you feel that try to creep in you get off that pitch and come back down in your range again we only want to train our body for what feels free we don't want tension to become the norm now you can put tension on it i just did there just for fun right i would for freedom do yeah 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 I want to make it more rock and roll we can put a little bit of tightness in it yeah 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 we can put growl in there and do all the other things yeah right when i want to i can put that in but it should be an effect that i layer on not the only way i can sing after you get used to doing those sustained pitches and holding them out for as long as you can you can put runs into it i like to do these uh pardon me nine tone scales so we do ah, Because what starts to happen is your body starts to figure out what that requires from your respiratory system, how much vocal load you're going to use, how your articulator is going to be involved over the course of 10, 15 seconds. Then your body memorizes that. And then you go into a song. You're going to rarely find phrases that are 15 seconds long. You're going to come across things that are more like eight seconds long. And all of a sudden, it's going to feel like a piece of cake. You're going to go through your songs and be like, man, these are easy. They're easy because you're spending time in your exercises doing the hard stuff. All right. So take advantage of that process using exercises to start extending the amount of uh, time that you're singing on one breath. And I'm telling you, it's going to pay huge, massive dividends when you go to work on your songs. And remember that golden rule, the weightlifting rule. You don't walk into the gym and bench press 200 pounds. It's not going to go well if you've never done it before. You figure out what your high note is and you focus on the two or three notes below it. And in time, if that high note is going to appear in your voice, if you are biologically designed for that note to come out, just remember, I'm a bass baritone. These high C's and D's, as much as I want them, they're there one or two times. They're not there for good, right? So you're going to find out what your body's capable of. But if it's meant to be, it will start to show up if you focus your work on freedom on the notes right below. Matt, that is great. I can't agree with you more about the weightlifting analogy, right? So I remember back to like um, playing football in high school, right? And you never just got to go on the field and practice, right? The coach is like requires the guys to, you know, you got to work out in the gym at least three times, three hours a week lifting weights. So it's the same thing. I mean, if I can't imagine playing football or doing an athletic event and just showing up and singing, you know, singing the song like you said, right? You just wouldn't do that. Yeah. You would do the work. Otherwise, you're going to be the team that, you know, it's like the wimpy guys and the game's over in the first quarter because you just didn't have the preparation, the exercises done, that strength building and coordination work out of the way. So great ideas, great examples on all of that. Um, and I just want to take a second to take a peek at the chat. We we'll get some great compliments in here, George. Thanks. Full day lesson. Hi. Hold on, we got one more question thanks, for George. you. So we'll get one more thing. Hi, and Catherine. Then, Good to see you here. Um, Catherine, yeah. uh, thank you so much for the shout out. Um, definitely, we have some ideas on YouTube um, coming. So uh, definitely, a video will, will be very helpful for a lot of people. So um, let's jump on into our last question, and then we'll take any questions uh, you guys have. Call it a, a wrap. So last question that I have here on the list. Uh, from Megan, I think my mask is giving me nodules. What do I do? And before you answer this, 
what what what's a mass? Can we define these terms just briefly, real quick? What, what I think I have an idea, but well, I, share that I shortened this that. question down uh, when we put into it. Hey, Jeff. Um, the full question was, you know, this was about the COVID mask that was wearing. Okay, I, I was wondering if it was like the the singer's mask, no, you know. It was that. And I've been hearing this in so many different people uh, saying variations like their mask is damaging their voice. And so when I saw this question come in, uh, I just shortened it so it fit on the screen because it was a long one. But I thought, let's talk about this. The mask is not giving you nodules. You trying to talk loud enough to be heard through the mask is what might give you nodules. Okay. And so let's clarify that. There is nothing about having a mask over your mouth that is doing damage to your vocal folds. All right. What the mask is doing is it's absorbing the high frequencies of your voice. When we speak, we have lower frequencies and high frequencies that come out. High frequencies are easily absorbed, whereas lower frequencies tend to wrap around things. That's why you can hear a car with the bass turned up and like five blocks away. You can't hear the words because the words are just hitting like the buildings as they go by, they're getting absorbed inside of the car and by trees and whatnot. But the bass is moving around in waves, right? So when you have a mask on, that mask is absorbing the high frequencies and some of the lower coming out. And the voice sounds muffled. So what everybody's doing right now is trying to talk louder. When in all reality, what you probably want to do is try to talk slower and brighter. Because if you're getting some of those bright frequencies absorbed by the material of the mask, if you amplify them a little bit more, there's more of a chance that they'll come through. So instead of saying, I think my mask is giving me nodules when you're talking through the mask and then trying to talk really loud that way so you can be heard, pitch your voice up. Higher pitches are actually perceived as being louder to our ear. There's actually a hearing curve you can look up online that there's a certain set of frequencies that they compare everything to. And below that, those frequencies sound quieter to our ear. And above that, those frequencies sound louder to our ear. So if you're talking in the lower part of your voice like this, instead, you're going to pitch it up a little bit and brighten it and say, I think my mask is giving me nodules. What do I do? Well, if you talk like this and you uh, put good consonants on your words, like Edry just mentioned, your, uh, whoever you're talking to should be able to hear you better. And there should be less vocal load on your vocal folds. So it will not be giving you that vocal fatigue that you're probably feeling. The other thing is, is you got to moderate how much you talk because the mask, it is a nuisance, but it's saving your life, right? I actually know somebody here in town right now. He's on day 32 on a ventilator because of COVID and he's 32 years old. I have a former student with a collapsed lung who's 24. That mask is saving your life, all right? Yes, it's a nuisance. So you might not be able to talk to somebody as much as you would like to. If it feels fatiguing, stop talking. And then take a period of vocal rest. And if you are in a job, I was talking to somebody once who had an issue with the mask and they were having a job where they were working at a drive through uh, you know, taking orders all day. And it's like, yeah, that's a problem because you can't really avoid that. That's your job. So I told him, you know, get the mic closer to your mouth. I gave him these tips that I just gave him. And I said, anytime you have a chance, do blowfish or straw phonation. All right, straw phonation, uh, I don't have any straws here, but you sing through a straw. It massages out your vocal folds. And the other thing that you can do is put your finger here and sing against it like this. And just sustain it out. What that's doing is it's putting a little bit of a resistance for the air and the sound waves as they're coming through your vocal tract. And that resistance sends some of those sound waves backwards. And what that backwards sound waves and air pressure does is it actually opens up your throat. We have video evidence of this. They put cameras in people's noses to see what happens with straw exercises, blowfish exercises. And what we see is that the throat opens up, the vocal folds then line up into a better vibrational pattern that's less stressful on the vocal fold tissue. So doing those throughout the day will be great. You may not want to take your mask off because you're in a spot that you can't. So just hum, roll your lips in and do a right? Doing that glide is helping stretch the ligament that's inside of your vocal folds. It's massaging it out and just even the sustaining single pitches. will do a lot of good for you as well. And Edry brings up an excellent point. She said, also, they are overcompensating by talking loudly because they aren't used to hearing themselves with a covering. And she's right, right? It's uh, We have something called the stapedius reflex. 
And it's already kicked in normally, right? It's the pedius reflex, the acoustic reflex, is that when we phonate, there's a little teeny muscle inside of our ear. Uh, there's the little thing right here called the stapes. It's a little elbow-like joint that helps send the vibrations from your eardrum up into your cochlea and everything. There's a little muscle there that clamps down when you phonate, right? So when you start making sound, your ears are going to stop moving. Your eardrum is going to stop moving as much. You're not going to hear yourself as loud as you would hear somebody on the outside. And studies show that this reduction can be as much as five decibels to 20 decibels. So 20 decibels means that if you're talking at the volume of a chainsaw, which is 105 decibels, you would perceive yourself as only talking as uh, at 85 decibels, which is just loud speech. That's what people do in a crowded room. But you wouldn't realize you're like screaming. And if you want a real life example of this, just go and sit in a public place and listen to people talk on their cell phone. And when you see them, you know, they got their phone up. They're like, yes, I'll be there soon. I know. That's because their stapedius reflex is strong. The sound from the phone is coming into their ear and they're hearing that loud sound and they're trying to match it. But they can't because when they start to make sound, that stapedius reflex kicks in. It stifles that uh, action of the ears and they hear themselves quieter. So they try to compensate and push through it and make themselves louder and they're yelling. And you say to them, hey, you're yelling on the phone and they're like, oh, sorry. And they don't realize it. So not only is that going on, what Edry just said, the mask is muffling it. You can't hear yourself like normal. So you're also feeling like something's off. So you're trying to push and push through it. Oh, yeah, that's a great way of saying it. Uh, humans have personal noise canceling. <laughs> that's right. We do. And, um, you know, it's supposed to be protective if you're yelling to help protect your ears a little bit from yourself. Or if you're anticipating like a gunshot and you hold your breath, they say that can also kick it in a little bit. But um. You know, yeah, it's a it's all about vocal fatigue, trying to overblow your voice. So let's just resummarize that. Do humming, do straw phonation, do blowfish to try to get your vocal folds massaged throughout the day. Pitch your voice up a little bit like that. Somebody mentioned my nose voice. Sure, let it be in your nose. It's COVID. Who cares? We're all just trying to survive, right? Let them think you're a little nasally because there is some research that says that when our nasal port is open, it actually helps relieve some of the stress on your vocal folds, making it easier to mix and singing. Well, that's also going to help you a little bit to mix in speech so you're not just driving it with pure chest voice. And then, like I said, maybe enunciate a little more, slow down your speech a little bit more, and just realize you may not be able to have an hour-long conversation with somebody if you're both standing in a setting talking with masks. You know, unfortunately, we we'll have to jump on video chat, but good news is, is you know, we're getting uh, some uh, uptick in vaccine availability, new treatments coming onto the market, the end is in sight. And hopefully by the next fall and uh, this coming winter, we're all going to be back in public together, uh, spending time and making music. Yeah, that's great. Looking forward to getting back to normal here. But um, uh, Zeke, thank you for the shout out. Uh, thanks for the love. Uh, definitely check out our channel. We have some cool yeah. stuff coming this year. Uh, we've kind of neglected YouTube, but we're coming for you. So um, <laughs> thanks, everyone, that's that's joined us. Uh, I guess we'll just chit-chat for another minute, see if there's any questions that came in. But um, George, Ariane, um, Edry, Jeff, Wendy, a handful of people, Vito, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all your, your feedback and anything. And if you guys have any questions, remember, you can just um, you can drop a note, voicelessons.com. We have a few contact forms or in our app. A voice lessons app um you can just ask us your question that's where these questions come from i think we're up to 800 some questions that we've gone through uh, so many questions i love this this is my favorite part of the week so um, <laughs> thanks everyone for tuning in we always have a good time um chatting so again if there's not, not any questions i wish you the best weekend you can have uh, you know stay safe Keep wearing your mask. And as Matt said, the end is in sight. So we're at the home stretch here. So, all right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week. Hope you enjoyed your free voice lesson here today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Good night. See you next week. Bye.